السلام عليكم Did you know that Prophet Muhammad peace and blessing be upon him had a secret space agency? At least this will be the only explanation that an atheist will come up with by the end of that video if he insists in rejecting God altogether. I will go through 20 miracles in the Quran and in the end you will have to decide. Either you believe this information is from God or you will believe that the Prophet came up with this information through his secret space agency in the middle of the desert in the 7th century. Get ready, bring your coffee and let's start. Throughout history, Muslims suffered the mocking of Islamophobes who are asking for scientific proof for every information that God provided in the Quran. One of them was the expansion of the universe. Until the beginning of the 20th century, Islamophobes had so much fun mocking Muslims who believed that the universe had a beginning, as science at that era concluded that the universe was eternal, without a beginning. The Quran clearly says that the whole universe had a beginning. Not only that, this beginning is well described. It says that the whole universe was compressed altogether in a single point, and then Allah caused it to expand. This is how he started the creation. While scientists of that era said that the universe is static, not expanding and always existed that way. Well, like every time science contradicted the Quran in the past, the Quran always came on top. We're lucky that we have now the technology and tools to observe, not to do guesswork. So let's understand what the modern science discovered first and then look at the same information from the Quran itself. The first discovery was called the cosmic microwave background radiation. That discovery clearly showed that the universe had a beginning and it's not eternal that they claimed in the past. This radiation dates back to about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. It shows us exactly how the universe looked like at the absolute beginning of time. In 1929, Edward Hubble discovered that the universe is expanding and most other galaxies are moving away from us. Light from these galaxies, when it reaches us, turns out it is shifted to a longer wavelength, i.e. redshifted light. Using this redshifting phenomena, we can determine the distance between us and the faraway galaxies, and also determine the speed of their acceleration. I cannot go more into details in the scientific discoveries, so if you find something a little bit hard to understand, you can Google it as it is. What we need to know now is the universe is expanding. So, if you go back in time, you will find it shrinking, 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 until it reaches the singularity. This singularity is marked as the beginning of time. And that beginning was 13.7 billion years ago. In this beginning point, the whole universe was compressed into a very, very, very dense point and then expanded, then created stars, galaxies, planets, and, well, us. And what Hubble discovered was that no matter which quadrant of the sky we look, we find galaxies that are moving away from us. And that led to an amazing amazing conclusion, which is that the universe is expanding. What happens as you begin to back extrapolate, as the scientists say, as you begin to think about what the universe would have been like a thousand years ago, or a hundred thousand years ago, or a million years ago, you go back as far as you want, and at each step back, the universe is going to be getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, until finally you get to a point where all the matter in the universe is congealed into a single point and that marks the beginning of the expansion. Thanks to the scientists for proving that the Quran was right from the beginning and that early scientists were wrong. And before we read the same information from the Quran, there is something that is also amazing. At school, many of us were told that the universe was expanding. But the gravity of all matter in the universe should cause this expansion to slow down and reverse, leading to an end of universe scenario called the Big Crunch as there is no reason for the expansion to accelerate. Logically, it should be the opposite. But now we know that the expansion of the universe is not slowing down. On the contrary, it is speeding up, it is accelerating more. And because there is no reason for this universe to expand more, we call the force behind this acceleration the dark energy. 
i.e. the unknown energy that we can't explain, so we call it dark energy. Now let's read the verses from the Quran about that topic and see if we can explain this unknown dark energy. God is saying, I built the universe and I am expanding it. أَوَلَمْ يَرَى الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَنَّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ كَانَتَا رَطَقًا فَفَتَقْنَاهُمَا Those disbelievers, don't they realize that all the heavens and earth were compressed together in the beginning and then I split them apart? And this verse describes an event in the hereafter. يَوْمَ نَطْوِ السَّمَاءَ قَطَيِّ السِّجِلِّ لِلْكُتُبِ كَمَا بَدَأْنَا أَوَّلَ خَلْقٍ نُعِيدُ This day, I will compress the universe, the same way you compress paper to make books. I will reverse the first creation. It started as one mass, then I split it apart and kept expanding it, right? In the end, finally, I will compress it again like it was in the beginning. These verses in the Quran are not the words of an astrologist in NASA. These are the words of God himself revealed to our beloved prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. Either you believe he was a prophet, or you can believe he had a secret space agency in the middle of the desert in the 7th century. The Quran provides amazingly detailed information about the life of the moon. A long, long, long time ago, the moon produced its own light. And then at a point in time, Allah shut it off so that it would not produce its own light anymore. Instead, what we see from it right now is reflected light. وَجَعَلْنَا اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارَ آيَتَيْنِ فَمَحَوْنَا آيَةَ اللَّيْلِ وَجَعَلْنَا آيَةَ النَّهَارِ مُبُصِرَةِ I made two signs for the day and the night, i.e. the sun and the moon. Then I shut off the sign of the night. It does not produce its own light anymore. And I kept the sun a radiant source of light as it is. هو الذي جعل الشمس ضياء والقمر نورا Allah is the one who made the sun a radiant source of light. And the moon, a reflected light. تبارك الذي جعل في السماء بروجا وجعل فيها سراجا وقمرا منيرا. Blessed is the one who placed constellations in the sky, as well as a sun as a radiant source of light, a radiant lamp. And the moon with reflected light. For years, disbelievers and doubters were mocking the Muslims for believing in this, asking for scientific proof, and Muslims didn't have any. Well, until NASA provided it for us. Watch with me this video on the channel of NASA itself. It's called the evolution of the moon. In the beginning, as you can see, the moon produced its own light. Then God shut it off. After that, what we see from it is reflected light. Exactly what the Quran said 1,400 years ago through our beloved prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. So either you believe he was a prophet or you believe that he had a secret space agency in the middle of the desert in the 7th century. Logically, you would assume that outer space is super bright as it contains the sun and all of the other stars. If one star that we call the sun bright our mornings and bright everything on earth, that means that millions of other stars will bright the whole space. But the Quran says the opposite. It says that outer space is completely dark. If we let them ascend up the heavens, they will find themselves in complete darkness. And they say, what's wrong with our eyes? Maybe something happened to our eyes. In other words, they would not expect the full darkness that they will see up there. Again, for years, disbelievers and doubters were mocking Muslims for believing in this, asking for scientific proof, and they didn't have any. Well, until modern science provided it for us. So this notion that space is always full of stars persists, even in our imaginations. The truth is, most of space is just empty, black, nothing. Most points in space are so far away from anything else that you can't even see the nearest galaxy.
So either you believe he was a prophet or you believe he had a secret space agency with modern technology in the middle of the desert in the 7th century. After the Quran miraculously described the whole outer space to be night-like, the Quran then described the day to be just a skin-like layer. وَآيَةٍ لَهُمُ اللَّيْلُ نَسْلَخُ مِنْهُ النَّهَارَ فَإِذَا هُمْ مُظْلِمُونَ Another sign for them. I can strip away the day and let them live in the dark. Strip away the day the same way you strip the animal skin before you cook it. The key word here is نسلخ. If we simply put this word in Google images, you get butcher images who are stripping the skins of animals. The parallel is as follows. The whole space is night. That is comparable to the inner parts of the animals, the meat, the organs, the bones, and so on. But the day is just a thin skin layer to be stripped away. That is the animal skin. Now let's take a look at any generated image of Earth from outer space. Can you see how the day is just a skin layer? These verses are not the words of an astrologist in NASA. These are the words of God revealed to our beloved prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. So either you believe he was a prophet or you believe he had a secret space agency in the middle of the desert in the 7th century. You will be shocked by this one. This is Carl Sagan the famous American astronomer, cosmologist, and astrophysicist. He introduced the cosmic calendar. He collapsed the entire history of the universe into one single year, so we can understand it. Midnight on the 1st of January marks the start of time, the Big Bang. January 1st, hydrogen started to form. January 10th, the first star ignite. January 13th, small galaxies. March 15th, our galaxy, the Milky Way. The end of August, the formation of the Earth was complete. That is exactly when the universe was two-thirds of its age. Skip forward to December 30th, the dinosaurs die. Eight minutes ago, humans. Fourteen seconds ago, modern civilization. Five seconds ago, Prophet Jesus. Four seconds ago, Prophet Muhammad. And in the last second, the American Revolution, French Revolution, World War I, World War II, and the first iPhone. It helps us understand how significant the age of the universe is. The Quran also has its own cosmic calendar, but before we read it, let me just clarify something for everyone who's not familiar with the Quran. The word day in the Quran almost never refers to 24 hours. It refers to any period of time. For example, تعرج الملائكة والروح إليه في يوم كان مقداره خمسين ألف سنة. The angels descend to him in a day that is equal to fifty thousand years. See day. Another example. ثم يعرج إليه في يوم كان مقداره ألف سنة مما تعدون. Then it all ascends to him on a day whose length is a thousand years by your counting. So Allah simply refers to any period of time using the word day. Now let's read what the Quran say about the age of the universe. الذي خلق السماوات والأرض وما بينهما في ستة أيام. Allah created the heavens and the earth and what is between them in six days. وقدر فيها أوقاتها في أربعة أيام سواء للسائلين. For those who ask, Allah created the earth in total four days out of the six. That means that the earth was fully created exactly when the universe was two-thirds of its age, right? Now, as you can see, both the cosmic calendars, the one in the Quran and the one that Carl Sagan came up with, say that the Earth was created exactly when the universe was at two-thirds of its age. Sorry, Carl Sagan, you must be sad, because Allah revealed this information for us 1,400 years before you. Now you need to make your decision. Either you believe that Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, was a prophet, or you believe that he had a secret space agency in the middle of the desert in the 7th century.
in the last century, we started to experience new altitudes that humanity never ever experienced before. After the invention of aeroplanes, then rockets, then the International Space Station, we understand too much about the skies that we never understood before. And we also learned that the higher you get, the harder it becomes to breathe. Until you reach a specific height where you really need oxygen tanks just to stay alive. For humanity, this is a recent discovery. But for Muslims, it isn't. Because Allah already revealed this information to us 1,400 years ago. يَجْعَلْ صَدْرَهُ ضَيِّقًا حَرَجًا كَأَنَّمَا يَصَّعَدُ فِي السَّمَاءِ Whoever Allah wills to guide, he opens his heart to Islam. But whoever he wills to leave astray, he makes his chest very tight and constricted, as if he is unable to breathe like the one climbing up to the sky. This is how Allah dooms those who disbelieve. Let me repeat this part. As if he is unable to breathe like the one who is climbing up to the sky. These are not the words of an astrologist in NASA. Either you believe he was a prophet or you believe he had a secret space agency in the middle of the desert in the 7th century. Before I continue, I want to ask you a favor. As you can see, this information will be very, very helpful to people seeking the truth or seeking to strengthen their faith. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, whoever leads to good is like the one who does it. So, share the reward, help this video spread by engaging first with it with a like and comment for the YouTube algorithm, and then share it with your friends on your social media accounts. This way, all of us get the reward, inshallah. Thank you. As you probably know, Allah starts a lot of chapters in the Quran with an oath. Sometimes Allah swears by himself, or by the angels, or by a lot of different things. Right now, I'm only interested in one of them. فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَوَاقِعِ النُّجُومِ I swear by the location of the stars. The first reaction of the Arabs normally would be something like, So what? What is so significant about the location of the stars? Look, see? There is a star there. See, I know its location. What's the big deal? So in the next verse, Allah said, وَإِنَّهُ لَقَسَمٌ لَهُ تَحْلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ If you understand, if you have the required knowledge, you will know that this indeed is a great oath. Actually, they didn't have the required knowledge. And this oath was puzzling Muslims for more than 1,000 years, until finally we understood. Turns out, when you point your finger to the star at night and say, ah, this is the star, this is the location of the star, you're absolutely wrong. Because this is not the real location of the star. For example, let's take a look at the star cluster NGC 6913. For light to travel from these stars to our eyes on Earth, it takes 5,000 years. That means that what we see now is not the location of the star. What we see now is the location that the stars were 5,000 years ago. The star itself now is long gone, might even be already dead. Now let's read the same verses from the Quran again. فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَوَاقِعِ النُّجُومِ وَإِنَّهُ لَقَسَمُ لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ I swear by the location of the stars, and if you have the required knowledge, if you understand, you will know that this is indeed a great oath. إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ What you are reciting now is truly the noble Quran. تَنْزِيلٌ مِّنْ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ and it is a revelation from the Lord of the worlds. The question is to you, will you accept this as a revelation from God? Or will you still claim that the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, had a secret space agency in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? Another very interesting oath that Allah made in chapter Al-Tariq. وَالسَّمَاءِ وَالطَّارِقِ I swear by the heavens and by the Tariq. Tariq is a word in Arabic that is used to describe someone who comes at night and knocks on your door. We need to understand what is that referring to. I swear by the heaven and by the Tariq. And what do you know about the Tariq? It is the piercing star. Okay. So now we understand that Allah is swearing by a star and uses a metaphor to describe that star 
as someone who knocks on the door at night. For more than a thousand years, Muslims could never find that star. But NASA did. A pulsar is a highly magnetized, rotating neutron star that emits a beam of electromagnetic radiation. The first pulsar was observed on November the 28th, 1967, with the help of telescopes. The name pulsar is derived from pulsating star. The definition of pulsate is, produce a regular, reoccurring throbbing sound. The word originates from the Latin word, player, which means to beat. They chose this name because, scientists were able to record sounds of this star, using high-end technology of the 20th century. We never imagined we would ever find a star that makes a sound of someone knocking on the door in the darkness. These verses are not the words of an astrologist in NASA. These are the words of God revealed to our prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. Either you believe he was a prophet or, unfortunately, you will have to believe that he had a secret space agency in the middle of the desert in the 7th century. Another very, very interesting oath that Allah made in the Quran that made Muslims super confused for hundreds of years. It was the one in chapter Al-Takwir. فَلَا أُقُسِمُ بِالْخُنَّسِ الْجَوَارِ الْكُنَّسِ I swear by the hidden star that you can't see. It moves and it vacuums. Mm, have you ever heard about a star that we cannot see and acts like a vacuum cleaner? I think I know one. The largest known black hole is located in the galaxy NGC 4889 and it's around 21 billion times the mass of the sun, it's like a giant vacuum cleaner in space. A black hole is very very dense, so it has extreme gravitational pull. Its gravity is extremely high to the extent that even light cannot escape from it, and it can pull a full star into it. And that leads us to another very interesting verse in chapter An-Najm. وَالنَّجِمِ إِذَا هَوَى I swear by the star when it falls. This verse also puzzled scholars for hundreds of years as the word Najm does not apply to meteorites or falling stars. This word only applies to real stars. And we have never seen a real star that fall. Or did we? This is a star falling into a black hole. You can check the whole video, by the way, on NASA Goddard YouTube channel. Now let's read the verses in the Quran again. وَالنَّجِمِ إِذَا هَوَى مَا ضَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَى وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَلِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيُ يُوحَ I swear by the star when it falls that Muhammad is neither misguided nor astray, nor does he speak from his own whims. He only delivers a revelation that was sent down to him. In other words, when you discover this phenomena, you will believe that this is a revelation from God. And Muhammad did not come up with it. There are also verses describing the journey of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, when he ascended to heaven until he reached the end of the universe, or the portal that got him outside of that universe. The verses describe the absolute end or gateway out of the universe as an extremely dark place where you might see things that are not there. The gateway is darkness covered by darkness. The Prophet's eyes were not affected by its illusion. He didn't see things that were not really there. He certainly saw one of the greatest signs of his Lord. Of course we don't understand anything, I don't blame you. But I can make it a little bit easier for you to understand. What might be a gateway out of our universe? This man is called Stephen Hawking. I'm sure you heard about him. And this is his lecture into a black hole, which he made in 2008. Let's read together. The hole would need to be large, and if it was rotating, it might have a passage to another universe. But you couldn't come back to our universe, 
So, although I'm keen on space flight, I'm not going to try that. Now let's go back to the Quran. The verses describe the absolute end or gateway out of our universe as an extremely dark place, black, where you might see things that are not there. But wait a minute, Stephen Hawking explained the first part only about being black. What about seeing things that are not really there? Well, check this out. Because the gravity of the black hole is very, very high, it bends light passing next to it. This phenomena is called gravitational lensing. So what you are really seeing is what is behind it. But don't be fooled by that. ما زاغ البصر وما طغى لقد رأى من آيات ربه الكبرى The Prophet's eyes were not affected by its illusion. He didn't see things that were not really there. He certainly saw some of the Lord's greatest signs. These are not the words of an astrologist in NASA. These are the words of God revealed to our Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. Either you believe he was a prophet, or you will have to believe that he had a space agency in the middle of the desert in the 7th century. One of the things that early Muslims struggled with so much was when Allah described the earth as ball-shaped earth. While most of the scientists in the era believed in the exact opposite. Not only the scientists of that time, by the way, also the religious books, including the corrupted Torah of the people of the book, also describe the earth this way. Let's go through the ancient debate in detail. First, the corrupted books of the people of the book, corrupted Torah and the corrupted Injil. The people of the book at that time believed in a flat square earth with four corners, each corner held by a big angel. And all of that is floating above water, and also, all of that is underwater. So let's imagine the full picture. Deep down, there is unlimited water. Then, there is a flat square earth held by angels from its four corners. Then, there is a piece of air called the sky. Then, there is unlimited water above the sky. Maybe this is why the sky is blue. Of course, people will ask me for proof now because this is a big claim, right? Let's read the proof quickly from the Bible itself. First, in the book of Psalms, God spread out the earth upon the waters. It suggests that there is water under the earth, but we need more proof. Psalms 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. He founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. It is getting a little bit clearer. Let's continue reading. Genesis 1. And God said, Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky. Based on all of these verses, it is clear that there is infinite water under the earth and infinite water above the sky. This means that if you dig deep enough or fly high enough, you should reach this unlimited water. And because people back then were very dependent on wells for drinking, that strengthened their beliefs of earth being built on unlimited water because every time they dig down, they find water and make a well. Let's continue. Now, the New Testament, Matthew 4, verse 8. The devil took him up to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. In a bowl-shaped earth, can you see all the kingdoms of the world from on top of the mountain? No, right? But according to this verse in the New Testament, you can. If you climb on top of Mount Everest, you will see the whole world. Which shows how they imagined the shape of the earth to be. Jeremiah 16 To you, the nations will come from the ends of the earth. Where do you think the ends of the earth are? Job 37 He unleashes his lightning breath to whole heaven and sends it to the ends of the earth. Again, where do you think the ends of the earth are? Isaiah 11 he will set up a banner for the nations and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. 
four corners of the earth. Now the earth is described as having four corners, like a square. And finally, Revelation 7. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth. I think it is clear now. Flat, square, earth, with four corners. At each corner, there is a big angel holding it and water under the earth and the water above the sky. In the middle of this society, in the 7th century, Allah surprised everyone by the exact opposite. يُكَوِّرُ اللَّيْلَ عَلَى النَّهَارِ وَيُكَوِّرُ النَّهَارَ عَلَى اللَّيْلِ Allah wraps the day and the night around earth like wrapping something around a ball. The key word here is يُكَوِّر as the same word literally means ball. The same word is also used to describe the imama, this head cover. I know it might not be stylish for you now, but the idea is it was wrapped in a ball shape. This is how Allah wraps the day and the night around earth. This was a huge test for the early Muslims. As for them to believe in this revelation, they would have to reject what everyone in the society around them believed in. It is either believe in Allah's words, or believe in science and common knowledge. And they succeeded in the test, and they chose to believe Allah's words, ignoring the opinion of anyone else. For example, in the book of Ibn Hazm al-Andalusi, he said that the evidence from the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet clearly indicates that the earth is ball-shaped, and that is what we believe in. Also, Imam al-Mas'udi said in his book, the line on the equator is the tallest line on the ball-shaped earth. Imam al-Ghazali said in his book, The sun is much bigger than the ball-shaped earth. Imam ibn al-Jawzi, earth is like a ball. Al-Fakhr al-Razi, earth is like a ball. When it's noon in some places, it's dawn in other places, and it is sunset in other places. Ibn Hazm, all the scholars of Islam agreed that the earth is ball-shaped because of the evidence in the Quran and Sunnah. Ibn Taymiyyah The consensus of scholars of Islam is that earth is ball-shaped. And finally, don't forget Al-Baryuni who calculated the circumference of the earth with an impressive 0.3% error rate. All of these people succeeded in a very, very hard test. As they were being asked, to reject all the science and common knowledge of their time and to accept the exact opposite revealed by Allah to us in the Quran. This is why they are great men, because they believed what the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, told them, even though science back then was not mature enough to confirm it. Now ask yourself, after science already proved all that, will you believe that he was a prophet? Or would you assume that he had a secret space agency in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? After Allah established that the earth is ball-shaped, he gave us more information about the rotation of the earth around its own axis and the orbit of the earth that was unimaginable to the science and the common knowledge of the 7th century. فلا أقسم برب المشارق والمغارب إنا لقادرون. So I do swear by the Lord of all points of sunrise and sunset that we are truly capable. The daily points of the sunrise and sunset are caused by the Earth rotation around its own axis. وترى الجبال تحسبها جامدة وهي تمر مر السحاب. You look at the mountains thinking they are firmly fixed. On the contrary. They are moving the same way clouds are moving. You just can't see it. Again, the Earth's rotation around its own axis. You are rotating with the Earth, so you think mountains are fixed, but in reality, they are moving the same way clouds are moving. Also regarding the orbit of the Earth, in chapter Al-Anbiya, كُلُّمْ فِي فَلَكِ يَسْبَحُونَ The Earth, the Sun, and the Moon each one of them is moving in its own orbit. Since these verses were revealed 1,400 years ago, Muslims believed in them as facts, whether the science of that time and common knowledge agreed or not. 
only today we could confirm this information using modern science. So either you believe he was a prophet or you believe he had a secret space agency in the middle of the desert in the 7th century. Something else that was very interesting. Allah revealed information about the sun in the Quran that was against the science and common knowledge of its time. والشمس تجري لمستقر لها ذلك تقدير العزيز العليم The sun is and will be moving until its final destination. This is the design of the Almighty, all-knowing God. The sun is not stationary, as science believed for hundreds of years. كل في فلك يسبحون The earth, the sun, and the moon, each of them is moving in its own orbit. This is the clear picture that Allah gave us long time ago about the orbit of the earth, the orbit of the moon, and the orbit of the sun. Did you know that the sun itself is orbiting the center of the Milky Way? And as a result, we are kind of being dragged along with it. Until the 16th century, scientists guessed that the earth was fixed and the sun revolved around it. And they mocked Muslims for not believing them. After the 16th century, the world started adopting a different theory, the theory of Nicholas Copernicus, who said that the sun is fixed and the earth rotates around it, which is more correct than the previous one, but still Muslims disagreed, because the part about the sun being stationary, as it was very clear in the Quran that the sun also has its own orbit. Only in the last century, where technology surpassed the era of guessing into the era of observation. Only now we understand that this description of the solar system in the Quran was correct, and every other guesswork in history made by scientists was wrong. These verses in the Quran are not the words of an astrologist in NASA. These are the words of God revealed to our beloved Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. So either you believe he was a prophet, or you will have to believe that he had a secret space agency in the middle of the desert in the 7th century. Up to you. Now, this is true, undenying, that the Quran uses terminologies and descriptions that are truly beyond a 6th century, 7th century person living in Mecca. The fact that Allah says, Kullun fi falakin yasbahun. The sun, the earth, the moon, each one is going around in an orbit at a time when nobody thought that the, that the earth moved, that the earth moved. Everybody thought the earth is stationary and things are moving around it. And even when Copernicus came with his model, the sun is in the middle, the sun is not moving and the earth is going around it. So both the geocentric and the heliocentric, these are the fancy terms, the scientific terms, the earth center and the sun center. The geocentric and the heliocentric models have these bodies stationary. Allah says, no, nothing is stationary. Everything is moving around in orbits. Nobody in the sixth century was saying this. Before we continue, let me remind you once more. This information might be an eye-opener to someone who is in desperate need of guidance. Someone who is sincerely looking for God. Don't miss your opportunity to share the reward with us by helping the video spread as much as possible. You also have our permission to download it and upload it to your own channel or any social media account. It is copyright free. Thanks for your help and let's continue. Allah said in chapter Fussilat, ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى إِلَى السَّمَاءِ وَهِيَ دُخَانٌ فَقَالَ لَهَا وَالْأَرْضِ اِئْتِيَا طَوْعًا أَوْ كَرْحًا Allah said to the earth and the heaven filled with smoke, submit to me willingly or unwillingly, and both submitted willingly. What I need from this verse is the part where Allah says that the space is filled with smoke. For hundreds of years, humans believed space to be empty, complete void. Well, that was before the discovery of cosmic dust. Let's read this small article from the website of the European Space Agency, Herschel's Observatory. I will scroll down a little bit. It says the universe is a very dusty place. Cosmic dust consists of tiny particles of solid material floating around in the space between the stars. It is not the same as dust you find in your house, but more like smoke. Hmm, space filled with smoke. Also in this article, a portion 
of the open cluster NGC 6530 appears as a roiling wall of smoke studded with stars in this image from the NASA ESA Hubble Space Telescope. Looks amazing, by the way. For hundreds of years, disbelievers mocked Muslims for believing Allah when he talked about smoke in space. But when the European Space Agency said the same thing, now they believe it. Ask yourself, did Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, know this information from God? Or did he have a secret space agency in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? Allah said in Surah Al-Anbiya, وَجَعَلْنَا السَّمَاءَ سَقَفًا مَحْفُوظًا وَهُمْ عَنْ آيَاتِهَا مُعْرِضُونَ I created above them a protective ceiling. However, they still turn away from the signs. Again, for hundreds of years, we couldn't really understand what is this protective ceiling above us that God provided. And what is it protecting us from? Well, of course, you expect what I'm about to say. We didn't understand until modern science helped us understand. Turns out, there is something called the solar wind. Allah protects us from it by the magnetosphere. When these energetically charged particles come to Earth, instead of hitting us and destroying us, they create something called the Van Allen radiation belt. You can Google it for more information. That is in addition to the ozone layer, of course, in the atmosphere that absorbs a portion of the harmful radiation from the sun. وَجَعَلْنَا السَّمَاءَ سَقَفًا مَحْفُوظًا وَهُمْ عَنْ آيَاتِهَا مُعْرِضُونَ I created above them a protective ceiling. However, they still turn away from the signs. Still want to turn away from the signs of Allah? Allah said in Surah Ar-Rahman فَإِذَا انْشَقَّتِ السَّمَاءُ فَكَانَتْ وَرْدَةً كَدِّهَانٍ Look at the heavens. And see when it's split apart and look like a red flower. Then which of your Lord's favors will you deny? This verse was puzzling to a lot of Muslims for hundreds of years. No one ever looked up in the sky at night and found something that looks like a red flower. Have you ever seen a red flower in the sky? Well, I did. This is a footage of a faraway star splitting apart. It's not something that you can see with the naked eye, nor can be predicted by a person in the 7th century, by a man in the desert. Now, ask yourself, did Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, know this information from God, or did he have a secret space agency in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? Allah said in Surah Al-Hadid, وَأَنزَلْنَا الْحَدِيدَ فِيهِ بَأْسٌ شَدِيدٌ وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ We sent down iron to you with its great strength and benefits for humanity. Wait, what? Wasn't iron here on earth normally, like from the beginning? And the answer is no. Turns out, iron was originally made inside stars, specifically red supergiants. The elements form together inside a star during fusion. When the supernova occurs, the iron fragments are blasted into space. And this is how iron came to Earth millions of years ago. By the way, I'm not referring to the Earth's core. I'm referring to iron that we find and make use of to create tools and structures. Hence the referral in the verse, It's great strength and benefit for humanity. That's crazy. I thought a lot of these were just scientific facts, and obviously, of course, they are. And a lot of these scientific discoveries were within the past 200 years, and the book was written 1400 years ago. I thought all the chemicals and everything on the planet, especially metals, I thought they were derived from chemicals on the planet. I didn't know things came from no. out of space and stuff, and to know that so early as well, it is, it's definitely an eye-opener. Either you will believe he was a prophet, or you believe he had a secret space agency in the middle of the desert in the 7th century. After we established that Allah sent down iron to earth for us to benefit from, turns out the same applies to water. Earth formed originally as a dry rock around a hot star. Water was not here from the beginning too. And without water, we won't exist. But Allah said, وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً بِقَدَرٍ 
فأسكنناه في الأرض وإنا على ذهاب به لقادرون We sent down to you water in a specific quantity and made it live on earth and we are certainly capable of taking it back This article in the Scientific American might help us understand the verse Let's scroll down a little bit It says if Earth's water was not formed along with the Earth then planetary scientists suspect it must have been delivered later via extraterrestrial messenger Both asteroids and comets visit the Earth and are known to harbor ice These verses in the Quran are not the words of an astrologist in NASA These are the words of God revealed to our Prophet peace and blessings be upon him So either you believe he was a prophet or you believe he had a secret space agency in the middle of the desert in the 7th century Allah said in Surah An-Nur The light or guidance that Allah provides for us is like the light that comes from a bottle filled with blessed olive oil that almost glows even if it's not touched by fire like the glow of a planet light upon light wait what olive oil glows without being touched by fire but we only see light from oil if it is burning and how does a planet glow in the same way the olive oil glow and what is light upon light what does that mean don't worry it's very easy let's watch this quick explanation together and we will understand Joanna Joyner of the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center says humans can't see this light. Our eyes just aren't that sensitive. To see the light that's emitted from plants all over the world, we have to use scientific instruments that are placed on satellites. Light gives plants the energy they need to grow. But what happens if plants receive too much light? The answer is they glow. This neon glow is actually happening around us all the time and it's the result of a cellular process where light from the sun is transformed and released as fluorescent light in a phenomena called chlorophyll fluorescence. The light exits the plant cell and is released into the atmosphere, which is why NASA stated that their satellite instruments have given climate researchers an unexpected global view from space of a fluorescent glow from land chlorophyll. But would you believe me if I told you that that bottle of olive oil on your kitchen counter also gives off a fluorescent glow that can be seen in space in much the same way as planet Earth glows? Or would you maybe start to question my IQ? It's not bad, by the way. It's true, folks. Olive oil, that rich substance we love to drizzle on our pasta or douse our salads with, emits a coherent light that makes it glow by fluorescence in the same way as our planet glows in space. Though it may appear dull under regular light, hit a clear glass of olive oil with a green laser and the oil will glow red. And it's not just lasers that will get the olive oil to fluoresce, ultraviolet lamps will do the trick too and are accepted as an official method for the identification of the purity and grade of olive oil, according to the US Bureau of Standards. The verse likens the glow of the planet with the glow of the oil derived from olives as both shine in the same way by fluorescence. Both are also dependent on the same physical phenomenon fueled by quantum physics and both emit a coherent light. Coherence is one of the most important concepts in quantum physics and is strongly related to the ability of light to exhibit interference effects. A light field is called coherent, like the light from lasers, when there is a fixed phase relationship between the electric field values at different locations or at different times. Coherent light waves are waves with a constant phase difference. They will have the same frequency and wavelength. When two waves meet, they will interfere and superpose. This is called the quantum principle of superposition and it's at the heart of quantum mechanics. If you look in the dictionary, the word superposition technically means one upon another. So when God says light upon light in the verse I mentioned just now, he's referring to superposition of light waves one upon another. The fact that the Quran states that olive oil glows is in and of itself a miracle as lasers and ultraviolet lamps now used to detect such a glow did not exist back then in any way, shape or form. 
Although planet is defined as a body that orbits a star, in our case the Sun, and produces no light of its own, and although olive oil is dull under regular light, not only did the Quran inform us that they both glow on their own, but the Quran also asserts that they glow in a similar manner. What's more, the Quran refers to it as light upon light, long before the existence of the quantum theory of coherence, which now confirms the superposition of light waves. So the question remains, how could the Quran have known to use such a comprehensive analogy 1400 years ago? Was the Prophet Muhammad a quantum physicist? The answer could only be that the Prophet Muhammad had received divine revelation from God, the creator and originator of the universe. Allah described the movement of all celestial objects in the Quran as swimming. He didn't say they are flying in space or moving in space. He usually uses the word they are swimming in space, swimming in their orbits. Stars are swimming in their orbits. Earth is swimming in its orbit. Let's read it together. First, Allah describes the Earth's gravity as one of his bounties to us. Alam didn't I make the earth for you to pull and collect? Then Allah described the movement of celestial objects in space by the word swimming. Each in its orbit swimming. For hundreds of years, we believed it as it is. Couldn't really understand the wisdom behind the description. Why swimming? But now, hmm, I found this article in astronomy.com. It will make it easy for us to understand the idea. Let's scroll down a little bit and read together this paragraph. Just as a boat creates waves on a lake, as it slices forward through the water. Stars and other bodies in the universe also create ripples in the fabric of space-time as they move. Astronomers call these ripples gravitational waves. Each in its orbit swimming. So this website is making the same parallel, comparing an object moving in space with a boat moving in the sea. And Allah described the movement in space as swimming. I mean, literally, you can think about space and time having a wave, just like an ocean wave in it, that travels through the universe. Gravity waves are just the same. Any type of mass in motion, big or small, generates a gravitational wave. And like the Earth's ocean tides, gravitational waves roll ceaselessly across the cosmos. If you have two objects, two compact stars, each of which curves space around them, and they're orbiting one another, then the result is, is that these two curved regions create a wave, a ripple in the structure, in the shape of space that moves outwards, carrying energy with it. That's called a gravitational wave. Either you believe he was a prophet, or you believe he had a secret space agency in the middle of the desert in the 7th century. In Surah Al-Tariq, Allah reveals a key difference between the space and the earth. By the heavens when it bounces back, but by the earth when it cracks. Seems like each of them has a different reaction. The sky bounces back while the earth cracks. This video might have the explanation for this oath. Let's watch it together. By the sky which has the bounce, by the earth which has the crack. Indeed, what is written inside the book is very serious and it's not in jest. Do you know what these two phenomena are? I will tell you. Simply put, when space is stretched out, it bounces, while when the Earth is stretched out, it cracks. Although we can't see a bounce in the sky, in 1916, Einstein's game-changing theory of relativity determined that spatial bodies move in the fabric of space in much the same way as a child bounces on a stretchy trampoline. And although we've always intuitively known that rocks are incredibly strong and can't be stretched apart, in 1789, when Iceland's sulfur fissure was opened, and in 1927, when the first crack in the earth was recorded in the Arizona desert, it was confirmed just how fragile and changeable our earth really is. 
A book from 1962 entitled Notes on Earth Fishers in Southern Arizona by Geraldine Robinson and Dennis Peterson published the information about the cracks in the earth that were first recorded in Arizona. So it was only in 1916 that science learned that the sky, space, has a bounce to it, which is at the heart of Einstein's theory of relativity. And it was only in 1927 that science learned that the earth has cracks. Yet not unsurprisingly, the ancient book that I speak of contains numerous proofs in the form of scientific facts and natural wonders that were only discovered by scientists centuries later. How is this possible? How could a book revealed so long ago, before the advent of basic modern tools and technologies, contain such accurate information about scientific phenomena? There is only one explanation for such a thing. The author of the book is the creator of the universe. The book was written by God himself. Do you know the book that I'm talking of? It's called the Holy Quran and is such an impressive book that it would forever change the course of the world. Allah said in Surah Fussilat, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ I will show them my signs in the universe and within themselves until it becomes so clear to them that this Quran is the truth. It will not take long for a sincere person to find the truth and to find God. If you have any questions regarding what we talked about in this video, or if you are interested to read the Quran and you need help explaining it and translating it for you, join us in our Discord server and join our group reading sessions. The link is under the video. And for our Muslim brothers and sisters who are watching, remember that the Prophet said, deliver my message even if all you can deliver is one verse. This is a very good opportunity for you. Don't let this video stop with you. Help it spread first by engaging with it with a like and comment, then share it on your social accounts. And if you are interested in more evidence of Islam and more miracles of the Quran and Sunnah, check out this playlist. I'm sure you will love it. Thanks and salam alaykum. <laughs> صالحا فيما تركت كلا كلا إنها كلمة هو قائلها ومن ورائهم برزخ إلى يوم يبعثون فإذا نفخ في الصور فلا أنساب بينهم يومئذ فمن ثقلت موازينه فأولئك هم المفلحون ومن خفت موازينه فأولئك الذين خسروا أنفسهم في جهنم خالدون تلفح وجوههم النار وهم في ألم تكن آياتي تتلى عليكم فكنتم بها تكذبون قالوا ربنا غلبت علينا شقوتنا وكنا قوما ضالين ربنا أخرجنا منها فإن عدنا فإنا ظالمون قال اخسأوا فيها ولا تكلمون إنه كان فريق من عبادي يقولون ربنا يقولون ربنا آمنا فاغفر لنا وارحمنا وأنت خير الراحمين فاتخذتموهم سخريا حتى أنسوكم ذكري وكنتم منهم تضحكون إني جزيتهم اليوم بما صبروا أنهم هم الفائزون